That's right. This is T Fitz, and I'm back again. Today, we're talking about mm, something that has, I guess, been weighing on me a lot, and also something that I think should be brought up to everyone and be on the forefront of our minds. Something that a lot of us really probably go through our day-to-day -day lives and don't think about, but we really should. Today we're talking about equality. And, mm, you know, equality goes down to a lot of things. The civil rights movement wasn't well, a lot of that about equality among the races. The big feminist movement, initially at least, started about equality among genders now i'm not saying and i'm sure all of us can agree to the fact that no one of us is truly equal to another however that's in a certain context that context being something to the point of maybe we're not equal because you're a man with no hair and i'm just balding you know Maybe I'm a little bit better at programming computers than you. Maybe most of the guys I work with are a lot better at programming computers than me. I guarantee you, most of y'all out there get me in any, you know, sport, that, like track and field or like, I don't know, all kind of stuff. You'd probably tear me up at it. So in that way, no, we're not equal. But with these movements and what we're talking about, is equality in the eyes of our justice system and i reached out to and heard back from the national coalition for men because men should have rights too men have been stereotyped in a certain way and this is not anything to dog women by any means however the world has come to a point and to a place where us as men need to band together to do what the original feminist movement was trying to accomplish, what the original civil rights movement was trying to accomplish, and that is simply creating equality in the eyes of our justice system and really in the eyes of each other and not in those other ways we were talking about to us all. So in 1977, the National Coalition for Men was brought about, committed to ending harmful discrimination against the stereotypes against boys, men, their families, and the women who love them. They're gender inclusive, nonpartisan, ethnically diverse. It's basically an organization that affects civil rights reform through advocacy, education, outreach, services, and litigation. Now, we're going to have to stop this right now and do a little bit of disclaimer time. If you are my son or in the presence of my son, you must stop this video right now. This video is not made for my son and these videos will be made age restricted once my son becomes a certain age. So. I thought we'd start out about talking about the philosophy of this organization. I'd give you some information on them and hmm, put some links down there so that if you are so inclined, you could educate yourself on these matters because I will tell you what, and I have unfortunately learned it for firsthand. Justice system when it comes to civil matters and children is completely biased towards women and if you're a woman out there watching this I'm sorry but it's it's true and I'm not trying to knock you you might be a great person and if you are a great person then you're probably also of the mindset that says you know what we should consider ourselves as equal and I'm not going to try to drag this man through dirt just because I'm angry. I mean, unless he did something just mm, 
unforgivable to you. Ah, uh, I don't know if any of y'all have looked into it, but I'd say a lot of these are big reasons why now we have the M MGTOW movement, the men going their own way. That is a separation of us, correct? Where? Mm, I do understand where a lot of those people are coming from. But wouldn't it be a lot better as a world and a society to bring everyone together? Is that possible? I don't know. But I mean, golly, it is a lot of these reasons we just spoke of that does have men more and more going their own way. Let's talk about their philosophy. They say that no individual is completely free. That's both legally and socially. Because society imposes a multitude of restrictive shoulds on its individual members. The shoulds developed over a long period of time serve as a major vehicle for maintaining order. While they evolve and change and sometimes allow for limited individual variation, they represent a powerful and ever present influence on behavior. One of the ways in which the shoulds function is by defining social roles. The what and how of everyday but important behaviors, like being a spouse, parent, child, employee, or neighbor. It's also been society's practice, however, to further many roles by gender. A spouse is either a husband or a wife, a parent, either a father or a mother, a child is either a son or a daughter. Y'all with me there? That's We're defining roles by gender, correct? And to require particular and different kinds of behaviors, thoughts and feelings from the males and females occupying these roles. We've heard in some detail from the women's movement how much sex stereotyping has limited the potential of women. Most recently, men have become increasingly aware that they too are assigned limiting roles, which they are expected to fulfill regardless of their individual abilities, interests, physical, emotional, constitutions, or needs. Men have few or no effective choices in many critical areas of life. They face injustices under law, and typically they have been handicapped by socially defined shoulds in expressing themselves in other than stereotypical, stereotypical ways. Society has taught us, for example, that a real man is strong, courageous, knowledgeable, disciplined, level-headed, competitive, successful, in control, unemotional, heterosexual, sexually aggressive, sexually competent, and silent suffering. A man is also dependent on women for satisfying relationships, for child rearing, for routine home and health maintenance like housekeeping and cooking. All of this and more society has taught us. It constitutes a man's role, privilege, or burden, as the case may be. Many men, however, are no longer comfortable with the traditional male role. Emotionally adrift, they are searching for a new identity. Yet they find few viable alternatives to traditional masculine behavior. And even these few are narrow and limiting. A view accepted in part by some of both sexes is that men's stereotypical behavior has resulted in the oppression of women and that it therefore must change. While this view may contain some elements of truth and may in fact have political validity for women, it's nonetheless an oversimplification which does hopelessly little to help men understand their own discontent or encourage them to seek out meaningful alternatives to the negative identity of the oppressor. The change and flux of these times seems to provide an excellent opportunity to redefine options for men in ways which will allow them to develop according to their needs, desires, and potentials. It also seems appropriate for men both to be active and to take initiative in this process rather than be reactors to a movement which is not focused on their needs and offers only a vague promise that the new world will be a better place for everyone. 
Well, the National Coalition for Men is an organization which seeks to help men take a self-motivated step towards independence. Some things they know. How men struggle in relative isolation with concerns about career, how they're frequently locked into a pattern of increasing salary, pressure, and time demand with decreasing satisfaction and opportunity for change. Free men would like to help men explore, develop, and choose career and career coping options. They know that many men are unable or unwilling to communicate with others except on safe subjects and in well-defined ways, and therefore deprived of the benefits of close personal relationships with both men and women. They'd like to help men develop and sharpen their interpersonal relating skills. And I mean, I don't know if y'all been watching this at all, but that's something I've been trying to do is to help us together develop our own interpersonal relating skills. They know that many men in the throes of separation or divorce are in pain, that they miss their children, they worry about money, they feel alone, and in addition, they have to contend with laws and customs which view them primarily as providers rather than as people. They'd like to help alleviate this suffering and help change the laws and customs which discriminate against them. They know that men have learned to cope with feelings such as anger only in stereotyped male ways. Ways which can be harmful to them and others. And man, I've been on that path. Mm, probably about two decades now. They'd like to help men increase their options for dealing with anger and other emotions. And I think that's something that we've been trying to do as well. Man, golly, we talk about ourselves a lot. We talk about our feelings and how to process them, right? They know that many men perform the parent role only in a perfunctioning manner, depriving them and their children of the essence of that experience. And they'd like to help men become more complete parents, as would I. Not become a more complete parent myself. I mean, absolutely, I'd like to do that, but the laws are not allowing it. Regardless, I would absolutely like to help men learn to become more complete parents, and I think that'd make a better world for all of us, especially if we could get it in and make this generational, because golly, don't you know, our kids are our future. I mean, we'll probably be dead and gone, but future of this world, and if you care about other people, you ought to care about the future of humanity. I think men should have a chance to work on such issues with all the information, support, understanding, and brotherhood they can each give to each other. Some of their main objectives are promoting awareness of how gender-based exceptions limit men legally, socially, and psychologically. Oh, man. We'll talk about some of the things that they know about men, uh, additionally. and But I think first we should look at one of the comments that someone said. And that was that it's a shame this doesn't consider the root causes of gender depression that made feminism necessary in the first place. And Mr. Mark A., I believe, gave a great response to this. Mr. Mark A. states that the root causes of gendered oppression are gender roles, which develop for various reasons, biological, etc., but were then became enforced by law in an unfair way on both sexes. The elite made the laws, not the common man or woman. The laws discriminated against both men and women in different ways. That made feminism necessary, yes. To the extent that feminism was about equal rights. But over time, feminists started fighting against equal rights and instead promoting and protecting laws that discriminate against men in child custody, domestic violence, etc. They became completely hypocritical. 
That's why the former president of the National Organization for Women, I believe that's what it is now, in Dallas, left now and started the Dallas chapter of the National Coalition for Men. That's why the mostly minority womanist movement doesn't want to call themselves feminist. One of the primary ways womanists differentiate themselves from feminist is their concern about men's rights and their willingness to include men's rights within their advocacy. Oh, I'll link down there to y'all something on that if you want to look at it. Freeman knows some things. They all obviously don't all pertain to me, but I am sure that many of us out there can see in ourselves, others, or at least relate. They're trying to free men from the notion which A, ignores the rigid definition of their roles and B, insists they are culturally favored. They'd like to free men from the tendency to evaluate themselves and each other by the degree to which they meet an impossible ideal. Freedom from conditioned competitiveness and the fear of sharing failures, anxieties, and disappointments with one another. From a mistrust of their feelings and instincts and an over-reliance on logical thought processes. From the notion that violent action confirms and enhances their manliness. Freedom from relative ignorance of their bodily functions and disdain for their body's warning signals. That one kind of hit home for me. Because my dad used to refuse to go to see a doctor. And he would have his body screaming at him something's wrong. Heart attack at 46. Quadruple bypass. Cancer and death at 56. All of which. I'm sorry daddy. Your body was yelling at you. Something was wrong. Mm, and I love you and I always will. Freedom from their conditioning to pacify and protect women, thereby inhibiting them from expressing their true feelings. From the pressure to be what they are not in preparation for their success role. From an over-reliance on their jobs for a sense of identity. From conflict between their polygamous sexual conditioning as youths and society's expectation that they will overcome that conditioning after marriage. I mean, I get what they're saying there, because, I mean, you are like, hmm, I get it. But at the same time, I don't know where they're going with it, because, I mean, if you're married and you, you, you commit yourself to one person, uh, unless you both, anyway, yeah, I'm just reading off of here. Regardless, also freedom from a preoccupation a lot of men have with sexual technique and from imperatives to concentrate on satisfying their partner sexually, seemingly at the expense of their own sexual pleasure. From the social barriers and pressures which stand in the way of their establishing close emotional friendships with other men. From the inclination to turn their wives into permission giving mother figures. From the need to prove their worthiness as protectors and providers. From feelings of inadequacy in matters of child care and child rearing. From feelings which inhibit them from developing a closer, more emotional relationship with their children. From divorce laws, which presume the naturally superior capabilities of women to care for children and which stereotype men as wallets. From national conscription practices which play on their traditional role as protector of the family and society. From harsher treatment under law for criminal violations than the treatment accorded to women in matters of arrest, conviction, and sentencing. From the notion that as a class they oppress women any more than women as a class oppress them or than society in general oppresses both sexes through stereotyping. So, I thought we'd talk about that a little bit. There is a coalition out there for any other men going through this. And it does seem, as far as I can tell from this point, they are going towards equality. This isn't an anti-woman coalition, as far as I understand. I'm not anti-woman. I'm not anti-anybody. I am pro changing laws to afford men equality 
when it comes to being able to see their children when it uh, comes to their ability to legally be a dad after divorce and where mm, it takes men out of the role of a wallet and turns them back into a loving parent I don't know if anybody y'all got any of this out of this but if you sat through it I sure daggum appreciate it and mm, like I said I'll link some of this down there to you below I just thought I'd let you guys know that this place is around they are doing work hard work on the streets and I am actually looking into it more and considering giving up a very nice job to go help these people fight so I guess we'll just kind of leave it at that I love each and every one of you Steve Fitz and I'm out